and thank you so much for uh, joining us today and um, part of the competition jurors for uh, Move Five competition. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, so I am Ben. I am one of the co-founders at Moo, I, and I'm also a chartered architect in the UK, um, currently working at Foster and Partners in London. And um, do you mind doing a quick self-introduction about yourself? Right. So I'm Tolu Onabolu. I'm uh, recently um, a lecturer at the University of Newcastle. Um, I've taught um, architecture for over um, I don't know, a decade now. Um, my main area of interest is in how we use, um, how, if you like, how technological tools or how computational tools are deployed in architecture, but also how forms of representation and visualization have changed. So um, a lot of this work comes by way of fiction, fictional narratives, um, virtual spaces, um, etc. Um, yeah, Great. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And um, do you see, um, so in, in terms of the, this competition brief, uh, where there's a space mission and we're sending people uh, towards Mars, and the brief is asking for students to design the kind of inclusive inhabitation for uh, astronauts from different countries to live there as the first uh, batch of human beings uh, uh, being migrating towards uh, the space. Uh, and just want to see your views on the setting of the competition brief and how you would personally approach the competition. <laughs> Um, so, may so maybe a little bit more background. I think the I think why the competition was interesting for me was again because of some of the work which I've done um, with fiction and how architecture uses fiction. We'd done like obviously um, sci-fi based work, and I think one of the projects on, in one of the years looked at the idea of um, of you know the architecture of the space station and things like that. So that was very interesting. But I think specifically with respect to the competition, I, I, I've read some of the work of um, Rachel Armstrong, and she's quite a, um, a seminal figure in, you know, extraplanetary explorations, extra, extraplanetary habitations, but also like living spaces. So when I think the, the, the winning entry was quite interesting because it was able to um, speak to some of those things. So apart from the types of, apart from the, 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 the different people who would be on the mission, it was also just the logistics of inhabitation within, um, in flight inhabitation or, you know, on the, on the vessel. So you need to be able to, the, 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 the spaceship as it were, or the rocket ship needs to be able to a, creates oxygen, you know, um, it needs to have um, composting devices, it needs to have quite a couple of things. You need to be able to, I think if you read Rachel Armstrong's work, you'll see that I think there's even um, some segments of it where the, there's this thing on earthworms and how, the, you know, the, how do you deal with, you know, biological matter or waste matter for humans and how do you use that as a as a, what would you call it now? Um, I, I can't remember the term. Part of the resources. Exactly. Part of the resources, exactly. How would you use it as part of the resources for life? Uh, so there's, there's a, I think one of the things which is really good about the, the, the Mars competition or the, 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 the inhabitation competition is it allows one to really seriously think about those things. And in a very strange way, it feeds onto the bigger conversations on, circular on, on the circular economy, because you need to engineer this recyclable, regenerative thing. Um, and yeah, with, like with, 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 a with a limitation on resources, because mm. there's only so much you can, there's only so much payload you can take with you. Yeah. There's only so much payload the, the, the vessel can handle. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's when when the uh, constraints of the environment uh, it kind of it, it shapes the design where there's 
Um, I think one of the research studies when I did in uni uh, was about 3D printing in space, where mm -hmm. uh, they recycle different tools and then mold them into materials and then reprint them. So they, yeah. can, space, uh, they can save space and also uh, because if you uh, ship like a screwdriver to space, it takes millions of dollars. But if you if you print it, if you print it, it, yeah, and then reuse it with different things, it, it costs nothing. Yeah, well, it costs less. It costs less. Yeah, it costs less. <laughs> Not nothing. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um. Great. And also, uh, part of the competition uh, discussion was about um, having um, more countries participating in the, this idea of migrating in, into space. So not just the, uh, uh, all the developed countries and also we, we want to be inclusive uh, in terms of all races and uh, different and non-discrimination against gender and also the kind of uh, different cultures are involved in this uh, big migration to a space. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think this competition brief uh, is strong enough to uh, tackle some problems like that? Because um, because for, for the setting of the, um, the brief, it's just like a mini structure uh, where we launch almost like a space capsule. Uh, and we, we our team think it's an interesting notion to study where it's a very limited space and having those people uh, living there and understanding each other's culture, it's a lot better than um, in the in the normal kind of, uh, situation on Earth where people are more comfortable with um, living uh, with people that they're familiar with and the cultures that they're uh, mostly exposed to, and as opposed to uh, having this unique situation and where everybody learns to live with each other and the culture. Um, yeah, what, what are your views on that? Because uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting, we will say we found it interesting uh, to be a concept to study with, but at the same time it might be a bit overwhelming for the competition brief. I don't know if it's overwhelming for the competition brief. I think, um, let's put it this way. I think it's, a good, it's good that it's a criteria because it allows us to, um, if you like, at least confront the issue. Yeah? Whether or not it's solved in the body of the competition is a different thing. But at least it's on the agenda. And I think that's a positive thing. So. The, the logistics of um, in capsule habitation is a little bit. I don't know what. I don't know how astronauts um, live, you know, in flight. And I don't think we've sent anybody on such a long journey yet. I think the best we've done is send them to space stations. Yeah. Right. And that's a rel that's a considerably shorter flight. So the. Um, nor, nor do I know the um, the actual architecture of the space stations. So I think if we if we were to look at it like you know like a big cruise, I think that what we would find is that we would invariably need I don't know docking ports. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because I, I, I'm struggling to see how you would put people in the same vessel, you know, except it was, you know, except we're in, we're in Star Wars or Star Trek mode where you have this intergalactic ship, yeah, you know, and then the issue of cohabitation and um, cultural integration becomes a thing. So I think what this competition was not able to address was maybe not so much intergalactic travel, but I think the, just, just the logistics of, um, of, of um, extraplanetary um, travel that you would need to dock at some point. I, I, I find it really hard to see how 
the, the vessel would just carry on continuously for six months or a year or something like that. Yeah. I think it's just six months. Um, I just I just supervised the dissertation on Mars, like I was saying to you earlier on, on the the Mars mission. So, yeah, I think I think sending mechanical devices or robotic devices to Mars is one thing, and it can be continuous flight. But I think it would it's quite another thing um, when you're sending people, and I think maybe that's the part that wasn't looked into. Nor nor do I think it needed to be looked into. I think it was it's fine that. The conversation has started, and I think it's quite original in that, um, from that point of view. So, um, and maybe I'm talking too much there. No, no, <laughs> I, I, yeah, appreciate. I, I think the, uh, uh, yeah, the feedback is good. So yeah, I think I think that could be. So the, the issue of how the the flight would be broken in stages, um, such that it's first such that it's manageable um, by humans. Um, would be the first thing. And then I think the next thing is, okay, now that we know we can, you know, break the flight into stages or break the mission into stages, what do, what do each of these stages represent? And I think that would be a bigger and longer competition. Yeah. You know, um, and obviously you're aware of the, some of the conversations around um, inhabiting asteroids or mining asteroids and things like that. So. That it could be part of that conversation, i.e., where do we land? What resources could we exploit? Um, but then it, it takes us into a much bigger conversation on what is this craziness of human beings trying to exploit the entire universe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it also feeds into the narrative where um, it might be impossible to avoid uh, global warming. Because with the history of uh, ice ages, um, everyone um, everyone is trying to do their parts. Well, most people are uh, trying to do their parts to slow down global warming. But it might still come one day, uh, based on the uh, the um, ice age cycles of the Earth. So one day we might still see all the ice cap melt and cover the whole of Earth, and maybe before that. People have to figure out a way to live off planet so that one day may maybe they can move back in or move to another planet. Um. <laughs> <laughs> There's a recent tweet from Elon Musk about the, um, the expansion of the sun. Right. <laughs> and tell me more about that. <laughs> no, I think I, I, I saw it last night or this morning. Um, and basically, what he was saying was except we. Um, there's no chance of us surviving this planet if we if we don't really start thinking about um, into extra planetary travel um, again because the because of the expansion of the sun. I think that um, just if we if you like back to the, the, your question, I think that the the issue of global warming is real and is serious, but. Except we were moving billions of people out of the planet. I don't know how um, extraplanetary inhabitation would so would address that issue, right? So what is it? Seven billion of us on this planet. Yeah. The Have you seen the film Elysium? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, so Elysium is interesting. I think it's Elysium with um, is it Matt Damon? I can't remember. Or Mark Wahlberg, I can't remember which which of the actors it is. And what is interesting about it is that it creates this um, thing again, where you have all of the wealthy people are out of space, and all of the run everybody else is on Earth, right? So we we get into that um, conversation again. That's the conversation that immediately comes up when we when we begin these things of okay so all the all the wealthy guys or all the wealthy or representatives from all the wealthy nations can afford to leave you know the planet and then the planet is just turned into a big dumping ground for everybody else yeah. so it, it's a complicated conversation i think uh, I, I think the because of the limited resources we have on earth and usually when people picture uh, 
dystopian future, it will be all the rich people who just flew out to outer space and having their good fun in their spaceship. Um, I don't. I, I'm not sure that's going to happen very yeah, soon. Me, but but I also don't think that we have. I I also don't think um, the issue on the planets is a limited resources issue. I think one of the bigger issues is um, it's maybe overconsumption. Mm. You know, I think we use more than we need to use. We con we consume yeah. way more than we need to consume, especially in the West, mm. or at least in the developing world, in the developed, in the in the in the wealthier nations. I think we we consume an in an extraordinary amount of of just stuff. Yeah, a lot of the stuff were just. Um... Yeah, like like what you said, over consumption and um, over production as well. Um, just because yeah. it's cheaper to make more and yeah. No, you, you make a, you make product. We make products so that we can earn money. Some of those products are completely useless, and then we create these big arguments on how there's a value system in these products, you know, or how there's va like I don't want to mention any specific brands, but you know, you you serve. You serve um, like soft drinks, for example. Like, what is the actual value of a soft drink? And one would argue that it gives refreshment. Well, water gives refreshment, right? But there's also the arguments on water: how much water is available and drinkable. So you have the big um, corporations that have taken over the, the the potability and the portability of water. And then they put a price. So I think I think I think these are the bigger I think these are the bigger questions. Yeah. You know. But anyway. Well, I, I've also uh, recently seen the uh, a more um, I think the uh, the series is called Lost in Space, but it's about this uh, or it's about the similar concept of everyone leaving Earth, but it. It becomes like an elite program where you qualify, where you're good for future generations uh, in terms of your uh, genes, your DNA, and your performance, uh, how smart you are, and then <laughs> you, you get to be chosen to uh, be the next, ge next generation to live in space. Um, I, think, I think that's also quite an interesting uh, uh, alternative perspective where how our next, our future generations will live when, yeah, and maybe it'll be funny if they saw this video. <laughs> what is it called? Lost in space. Yeah, it's it's. More it sounds like, uh, it, it sounds like it sounds really cynical. Uh, yeah, it's also about um, alien space robots. So I, it's just okay. playing into the same concept. So. I mean, I think I think re realistically, we need to be really careful about the, the conversations on um, extraplanetary inhabitation, extraplanetary um, exploration. Mm -hmm. Because A, why are we interested? I think the first question is why are we interested in it? And I can see how from, you know, just a human drive to do more than themselves, you know, how this is a thing. And we are human and we will you know, carry on doing those things. But I think selling it as a solution is maybe where the problem is because it, I see how as part of our enhancement of the species, it is an, it is a, it is a, it is, it's a really important thing, mm -hmm. right? But I think it's for the species on the planet, if you see where I'm coming from. I think these explorations are for us on the planet, and maybe it's going to make us a, 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 a better planet or a more habitable planet. So from that point of view, I, I completely, I, I can see how the, um, these missions are important. From the point of view of moving out of the planet, I think, I think that's a different kind of conversation. <laughs> I think, yeah. Yeah. I think it comes with a lot of problems. Like you, you've just mentioned, and I think that the first and clearest one is: a, you would have, um, you know, an elite group of people 
able to leave the planet. And it will plunge um, the rest of the planet into, I think, into a lot of um, instability. I think you would, it's, it's inevitable. We just need to go back into our history. Yeah. So if you plunge everybody into a dark ages, then it gets problematic again. But anyway. I think it's starts to become uh, something that we saw earlier in the year uh, in the UK, um, where people, the government has to decide who gets the uh, COVID vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it's sort of in the. I think it. I think it is. I think it is exactly like that. But I think it's. I think it's significant. I think it's significantly more. Um, problematic because what you're looking at is the infrastructure to carry people mm. right so first we need to build the stations on the planet to move people but we also need to build the the vessels that will be able to take off from those stations mm. and I think if if we look at it, how many what are the various launch sites on earth currently you know they're they're quite strategically located. Yeah. They're they're there are not that many launch sites. Um, do, you, do you see what I mean? So, mm -hmm. I I think I think there's some things that need to be addressed just in, just in terms of the the practicalities of. Um, Who to launch into space first? Yes, <laughs> or even how. Yeah. It's one thing to send a rocket. You know, they f figure that out. It's a projectile. Um, it has an escape velocity, et cetera, et cetera. But to move a vessel, they, it, may need to, it may need to be assembled out, um, you know, it may need to be assembled in space, like the space station, so that the, the vessel will be built yeah. outside of the Earth's atmosphere and, you know, within a sort of zero gravitational space. Yeah. I, I think if we look at the details of a logistic it might be uh, might be possible that people are launched into space station and then in the space station they launch uh, from space station to another space station that's near the exactly and exactly or or that we do it you know you know launch to the moon or launch to mars and do the assembly there so maybe the value of going to mars is that Mars could become, um, if you like, a shipping yard? You know, like that's where we assemble our our uh, our extraplanetary or intergalactic vessels. Do you see what I mean? And and then there's <laughs> here comes another problem where um, in in the world we're living in right now, where shipping containers are <clears throat> abandoned after they arrive. <laughs> Because they're more expensive to ship back than uh, shipping a new one. I think it, it has uh, lots of issues like that that are still being resolved today. Yeah, so I think I, I think this is <laughs> I think you're hitting the, the you're you're nailing the problems. So if we if we just look at how much so let let's take the I think let's start with shipping first. So first shipping and then shipping containers. So to assemble a to assemble a ship, right? You need a you need a what is it a, a, a shipping yard or something like this. Yeah. So we're going to need the equivalent for um, these spaceships, right? Then to the moving of cargo on these ships. Is where you're now is where you're talking about where, where we have an equivalence with the shipping containers yes yeah and okay shipping people to space station <laughs> okay so let's imagine that we're actually finally maybe in 50 years able to build these um these spaceships right and maybe around the same time we've also figured out how to deliver cargo yeah yeah the problem then is do we encounter the same issue with our current system of moving cargo, of containers staying in one, you know, one port? But I think they move the containers up and down. It's just expensive to move because nobody wants to carry empty cargo. Yeah. 
So that's a that's a capi- that's a capitalist problem, or oh, that's a problem with with capital. And I'm not, I'm saying this in most um, robust way, in the sense that people have invested in these missions, people have invested in these technologies. They need to reap the rewards of their investments. And once we can, once we're once we're able to actually practically engage that, then there's a conversation. Yeah. So I think I think the, I think the mission I think the comp- I think it's I think what you're doing is very very is exemplary in the sense of you're making it a mainstream conversation. I don't think it's that important that you don't have the answers, but at least the conversation has started, and because the conversation has started, we can flag up, you know, where we think there are mm. issues. I, I, yeah, we we do think um, like having these uh, ideas. Um, and by the device of competitions, we get to see uh, different ideas from different places and different mm-hmm. designers. And it's important to um, have all these ideas together, almost like a think tank where new ideas can generate on top of them. Yeah, yeah it's important that we... No, I, th- I think it's really good. I think it's really good. And I think the fact that the, the conversation the conversation is happening amongst, you know, first architects, but also more generally ordinary people. Um, I think it adds value to the to the conversation as well. This is what, like, just ordinary people are thinking. So yeah, I, th- I think it's great. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you for your, for your support. <laughs> you know, in the- no, no, no. Honestly, I think it's great. I think it's a, I think it's brilliant. I think you know. One could say, oh yeah, the competition can't do this and it can't do that. And I think, you know, if I was, if I was going to be cynical or, or overly critical, I'd say, like, what is this diversity issue on the, you know, on the competition? But that's not the issue. The issue is that you're putting the problems on the table. Mm. And I think that's where it wins. You know, the, the success of the, of, the, of the enterprise is that the problems are put on the table. People should come at it as they want. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes they they um, they look naive when they're just like put onto the spot when there's uh, not much expertise on it. But it's important to start the conversation rather than uh, yeah. trying to be an expert in eight to ten years. And um, I think it's important to start the conversation because you can learn a lot quicker um, through the crowd, as it were. So you get like multiple responses. And you're like, ah, that doesn't make sense. Okay, this looks a bit cool. <laughs> and then, you know, and maybe somebody will direct you to actually, to NASA's actual research on the problem. Mm-hmm. And that takes you to the next level of this. And then maybe from conversations like this, you're like, okay, there are actually logistical issues with, you know, getting people across space for six months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, proper problems with that. Yeah. They, I don't think, I'm not sure human will survive that trip in in our with the current technologies that we have i'm not sure a human will survive that trip of continuous travel for six months i think they'd have to break it they'd have to break it they'd have to do you know a lot of things will have to happen so we're very far i think we're very far from that mission do you see what i mean yeah, they this. If if they have sorted out everything, they would have done it already. <laughs> no, but I think they're. I'm sure they're asking the same questions. Mm. I'm sure, like NASA and SpaceX and all these other um, big um, entities that deal with space travel are asking these questions. Yeah. I I'm just not. I'm not sure that practically speaking, a we have the technology to. To, to send people out for that kind of time. Right. But yeah. the, we, do have, we do have it for, you know, launching them to a space station, but I think that's a, that's a couple of hours of flight. Yeah. And then they, they lift stationary uh, to the station for four to six months, I think. But they, they are never in a moving capsule. Well, they move exactly. around, they orbit around the Earth, but that's... Um, yeah, but it will be bo- just yeah. slightly faster. So I think I think maybe one of the good things that will come out of this 
um, work is, you know, what is maybe even a, a better understanding of the architecture of space stations. I think that could be very interesting because that could then inform, you know, how practical it is. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of conversation going on about 3D printed habitats on Mars and things like that. I think the, I think the first thing is docking stations. I think the, the first problem is docking stations. We're probably going to need a couple of docking stations on routes to Mars. Yeah, and I, I don't think the, the mainstream covers the, the really important part of the logistics. What's that? As in docking is quite, quite an important part of the logistics that no one yeah. covers it. I'm sure they're covering it. I'm sure it's being dealt. They will be impossible. I'm not a. I'm not. I'm not an engineer or a space um, engineer. But I think that just from a you know as an architect and urban designer, I think that just moving people or moving goods, you know anything. In in that amount of time requires some. It, it requires. It requires. Yeah. If you like, it. it yes. It, it requires a lot of things. Breaking down things into steps. Yeah. You need to break things down into <laughs> steps. Exactly. Exactly. You, you got. That's exactly it. Not not a rocket from Earth and then into into Mars. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If you know the, I think it's successful. Like I said in the beginning, it's successful when you're moving. You know um, what is the what's the robot that is on Mars called now? Um, Curiosity. Discovery, Discovery, curiosity, or this one, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think it's it's different. It's different when you're moving those. These are mechanical devices. Yeah. You know, they don't live, breathe, um, or you know, they have no biological functions, as it were. Hmm. So you can move them. Yeah. Is there any um, references you would want to share with? Uh, any students or designers? Uh, I know you mentioned Richard Armstrong. Uh, yeah, so um, the, I think for for the development of this competition, I think it's the two main references for me will be Rachel Armstrong's work on obviously um, space travel and space. I think it's called Sky Arc. Sky Arc. Um, let me just check. I think it's called Sky. I haven't read it in a couple of years. Um, Sky A R K. I think. Um, I'm just gonna end. Hang on. For some reason, Star Arc, pardon me, Star Arc, S T A R A R K, Star Arc. All right, so it's living, self sustaining spaceship. So that would be the first um, reference. The second one is the, um, there's a trilogy by, let me just, I don't want to say the wrong name. Um, Inhabit. It's called. I think is inhabit. Is inhabiting Mars. Red, blue, and green, or something like that. Let me also look. Um, and I think the author is called Robinson. Something Robinson. Right, Kim oh. Stanley Robin. Kim Stanley Robinson, mm. the, um, and the Mars trilogy. Oh yeah, it's red, green, and blue. Right. So yeah, I think I think those would be the starting points, and I think if the if the work if the work is to be taken quite seriously, once those and I think the value that architects bring to it is that we have we're able to think creatively about habit in um, about habiting people, you know, about giving people spaces to live to thrive. So I think it's a good question for architects um, but those will be the two reference points and then once we get once we once we're comfortable with those then I think the bigger conversations then go out to okay so hey NASA what are you guys working on we're interested in this can you help us 
or how can we work together? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's important that uh, Upsex take a look at the uh, the social aspects of space travel, where um, because we're not trained as an engineer or aerospace engineers, um, it's um, yeah, it's it's helpful that we look at this from an architecture uh, or architectural designer's perspective, mm -hmm. where you look at the immediate uh, surrounding spaces and the kind of people. Uh, so I I think these uh, references uh, you gave would be really helpful for people that want to take on to the subject matter. Hopefully. Um, yeah, so uh, one, one more thing I want to uh, cover about the competition is uh, the video format that we uh, asked them, asked the design entrance um, to submit, which we found that uh, not a lot of students are uh, comfortable with video formats and also with the new uh, digital tools that are coming out, such as gaming engines and the kind of immersive design tools. Um, and I just want to hear your insights into um, videos because it seems like architects are underutilizing the tool right now. <laughs> okay, the, I think the let's put it this way. So the competition speaks to, if you like, a certain age demographic, right? And that demographic would be, I suppose, in their early to mid 20s or early to if you like late 20s yeah. um, a lot of these a lot of these students would have been exposed to a suite of digital tools but again um, it depends on where they have studied or you know what universities they have studied at and what emphasis has been placed on these tools. And then that's when that's where you find the next round of problems. So the the a lot of academic um, a lot of teaching in architecture does not engage digital tools to those degrees. So you're here talking about maybe the AA, the Bartlett, um, Edinburgh, you know, Bath. There are a couple, there are a handful of schools, at least in Britain that engage these technologies quite significantly. But there are a lot of other schools that engage them, you know, with caution. And I think even these schools which I've mentioned, I think you'd find now that there, um, it would only be certain studios that deal with the technology issue significantly or robustly. Um, and I think what you get in the competition is a reflection of that in the sense that Yes, we know that these tools, techniques, technologies are available and are mainstream, but we don't have that much adoption. We don't have as much adoption as we would like. Yeah. So I think, again, the value, of the, comp the value of competitions like this is that it puts it at the front of the problem, that the video format is one for you to think about, to begin to... Um, to engage with, um, and I think it's here to stay. So if you, if you look at what is happening with um, hybrid teaching as a result of lockdowns and you know restrictions on COVID, as educators, we have to prepare um, content in video format, right? And so I've, I'm coming to Premiere Pro quite late in my life. Do you see what I mean? Right, and 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 from and from time and Herman is here. From time to time, I I have to scream to Herman. Herman, help! <laughs> I have a limited amount of time to do this. You know, I need your help on this. But I think I think that that's the that's the reality. So on the one hand, you, we have things like just simple video editing, okay. But on the other hand, we have the actual creation of animations and um, visualizations and things. Like that. And I think. I don't actually think I was ever able to do, um, no, not ever, I don't think I've ever successfully done a walkthrough, an animation. <laughs> I've done many, many renders, but I don't think I've ever done video, uh, right? right? Right now, there, there are a lot of uh, tools that are 
really quick to use, such as Enscape, where you can just draw a path on Rhino and then render the whole path. All right. Yeah. So there, there are a lot quicker tools these days to create animations. Uh, and yeah, like like what you said, it reflects on the adoption of these tools. It's a, I, think, I think that's where it is, and, and what the options are. You know, so I think the, like, again, I think these compositions, I think the, the, the way you're structuring yourselves as Moo, I think is really, is really good. Because on the one hand, it's a teaching platform, but on the other hand, it's an engagement platform, right? And I think just doing that puts all those things on the table in, in, a, in an almost informal way, which means adoption is easier. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like school where you, you know, you're going to get a grade and you're like, oh no, I need to finish this really quickly. I don't have time for that animation. I'm going to find the quickest, rattiest way to do this thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and also uh, same as uh, working in a practice where people just want to keep on using the same methods. Uh, where you because, because, there's, because there's time. Because you, yeah. These things are being clocked. Yeah, and there's also uh, time and uh, resources that are needed to adopt new technology, which could speed up the process of uh, producing these uh, services. What I call, mm. uh, but it, it's the initial bit that people need to get through where they could do better work after. But there's also hardware issues. So, you know, we're talking about gaming engines. So let's say I want to use Unreal Engine or I want to use Unity. Right. Okay. So Unreal Four is free. I don't know if Five is free, but at least Four is free, right? And I think Unity also has a free platform, a free um, what would you call it now? A free release. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So fine. We have these tools which we can use for free, but do we have the computers to drive them? Yeah, the graphic cards has to be. Do we have the exactly the? So I think that, I think that, I think. What we're looking at is a whole series of issues. So somebody goes on to, you know, is able to download Unity, but then they're maybe not able to use it because their computers can't carry. But then the interface of Unity is not for um, architects. It's for level designers, right? So, and then you go into Unity and like, oh no, no, I can't do this. I'm just gonna go back to SketchUp. <laughs> That's what happens quite a lot. <laughs> so that's what's, that's what's going to happen. I, I'm just going to, no, 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 I'm not doing this. Um, yeah. So I think, I think it's an adoption issue. And I think, um, yeah. And, and this is what you find with these tools. But also because we're coming at um, animation and visualization as architects, the people who are experts in these roles use them very differently. You know, they take different attitudes to lighting, to shading, to, to mapping, you know, to modeling and to detailing. Yeah. And we try, as architects, because we're, we're generalists, we try to do everything. And you'd find out that um, animators, professional animators or professional modelers don't do that. Mm -hmm. There is one guy, there is one guy who's going to do the polygons. Yeah. Then there's another guy who's going to do the subdivisional modeling. Then there's somebody else who's going to do the eyes. And then there's somebody else going to do the rigging and the shading. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, exactly. I, think, I think as architects, we try to take on a lot. Um, and maybe that's the, the strength because something else comes out of that creative enterprise. Um, and maybe what could come out of this is just again, forefronting the need for collaborative practices. Mm. So, you know, where architects are, where, where architects begin to see level designers or game designers as part of their creative team. Yeah. And maybe where the architect is not considered to be the boss of the project, but it's a more organic enterprise where, which consists of architects, sociologists, you know, graphic designers, game designers, engineers, aeronautic engineers, and things like that. And then you get a you get a much richer 
um, production, you get much richer creative outputs from that. Yeah, I, I think it, this highlights um, the transition uh, of the role from an architect to, well, back in maybe a hundred years ago to today, where architects used to be uh, the guy that know all the generalized knowledge. And, but as all of the trades get more and more specialized, it gets harder and harder to uh, sort of manage, but then uh, it becomes like a the role of a designer and a coordinator with all the how these could work together. Um, almost like the person that's writing the thesis, yeah. and also <laughs> coordinating things. I think you, what you'd find out is that the the architect of a hundred years ago. Um, was was part of a bigger institution, so they would be part of a school or part of a, a works organization or a, you know like an, the engineering units for a city or something like this. Yeah. Uh, that would that would have been the general. Yes, we know about you know the the most celebrated architects, but then when you check to see what what you know how did Walter Gropius actually work or how did Mies actually work? Do you know what I mean? They worked within big institutions. Um, it's the same thing when you look at you know the, the the advancement of the international style or the international movement, um, or even the, a more controversial one like colonial expansion. Right, the the architecture was happening in public works offices, mm -hmm. not so much of the individual celebrity architect or the individual celebrated architect. And I think you see it again in, in today's architecture. So while we might celebrate Norman Foster, Norman Foster is not responsible for the production. Foster and Partners as a corporate organization is responsible for the production. Mm -hmm. So maybe all that we've seen is a transitioning from um, public works offices, so public sector-based architectural production to private sector-based architectural production. And I think once we're able to embrace that properly, then we find out that actually within these organizations, you have a range of professionals. Mm. You know, we call it, we call the production architecture, but it comes, it comes about by a, a, a diverse, robust range of people. And, and, and professions and expertises. So, yeah. yeah, I think we've probably gone full circle. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts and, and all of that. And, uh, My pleasure. Yeah, is there any, any other things you want to cover? Or, uh, no, no, I think it's fine. I think we can leave it there. Yeah, <laughs> full circle. So, uh, thank you so much. I think we can leave it there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, hope, I hope I've been helpful. Yeah, that, that's really good insight and I, I think our uh, students and also uh, all the young designers out there will uh, appreciate uh, all the input that you have given today. Okay, cool. So, all right, brilliant. <laughs> good to talk to you. And, and you too. And, and all the best. And yeah, let's uh, keep in touch. Okay. Let, let's yes. let's do what you're doing next. Well, yeah. Definitely keep in touch. Okay. All right. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>